Good afternoon. Welcome to Midwest Changemakers, a webcast series by CNU Midwest, CNU Illinois, and CNU Michigan. Midwest Changemakers highlights the people, organizations, and projects that are creating tangible change in Midwestern communities. My name is Jocelyn Gibson. I am the chair of CNU Midwest, an organization that promotes equity, sustainability, and vibrancy through urban policy and professional practice. Um, we are so excited to welcome our guest today, Amanda Golden. She's founder and principal at Designing Local in Columbus, and Rachel Smith and Marissa Schultz from All Together Studio in Chicago. Uh, thank you for spending your lunch, guys, with us today. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, my guest host today is Nolan McCase. He's an urban planner um, with Stone Co. in Cincinnati. Uh, Nolan, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Thank you, Jocelyn. Hi, everybody. My name is Nolan McCase. I'm joining you from snowy Covington, Kentucky. I have lived in Dayton, Ohio, Denver, Colorado, Boston, Massachusetts, and Chicago, Illinois and have been involved with Congress for the New Urbanism Midwest chapter and Illinois chapter. I started my career in the environmental sciences and policy driven by a mission to improve environmental justice. I discovered urban planning while living in Denver and serving with AmeriCorps and found planning to be an important tool in achieving environmental justice. I pursued a master's degree in urban and environmental policy and planning at Tufts University in Medford, Massachusetts, and am now the new urban and environmental planner with Zone Co. in Cincinnati, Ohio. Thank you so much, Jocelyn, for having me. Yeah, thank you for being here, Nolan. Um, this is a, just a reminder to our attendees that there is a Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Um, please feel free to ask a question at any point during the session, and we will answer those questions at the end. Um, again, we're so excited for our guests today, um, giving us their time, giving us their insights into the work that they're doing. Um, so with, I'm just gonna jump right into it. Um, both of your organizations are engaged in public space activation in really unique ways. Um, you're finding creative ways to local leverage assets and spur activity. Um, all three of you are passionate enough that you launched your own businesses. Um, can you each speak for a moment about your firm's um, and the work that you do and what drew you to this work. And Amanda, we will start with you. Awesome, thank you so much, Jocelyn. Uh, my name is Amanda Golden. I am the managing principal at Designing Local and we are based here in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, our firm, we call ourselves a cultural planning firm. Uh, we do public art planning, placemaking, public art curation. Uh, and we also do urban design and we also have an arm uh, separate from our company, but a sister company that does landscape architecture. Uh, so we spend the majority of our time with municipal clients, helping them understand how policy, uh, uh, and different planning tools can really support injecting creativity into the built environment. Um, you know, right now we're working all over the country. Uh, we're working in California, in Anaheim, California right now, Peoria, Arizona. We're finishing up a project in Moline, Illinois, um, doing a couple of projects in Georgia, uh, and then a couple in Ohio as well, and are just wrapping up a project in Frankfort, Kentucky. So, um, you know, we started in 2014, and I think the, uh, the landscape at that time and appetite for uh, things that were related to arts and culture in the planning field were pretty slim. But we're finding now that this is something that people are finding value in and believe in uh, so much so that municipalities are putting money towards spending on planning for culture and planning for public art and planning for how to integrate creativity uh, into many facets of uh, community life. Great, um, Marissa, um, you next, please. Yes, thanks, Jocelyn. I'm Marissa Schultz with All Together and here with my amazing partner, Rachel Smith. We are a community engagement, branding, and communications and, and placemaking firm. And Rachel and I both recently came from a planning and landscape architecture firm that really focused on larger, the larger context of planning and design. And you know, as we were working on a variety of different projects around the country, we realized no one was really packaging these services together. You traditionally have your, you know, your marketing firm that's working on branding and communications, and you've got your planning and landscape architecture and architecture firms focusing on the planning and design. And so we really wanted to launch something that would bring this all together um, through a woman-owned firm. And so we, we started all together in July, smack dab in the middle of COVID. So 
I know some of you may already, we might've lost 15% of you and thinking like these women are crazy, um, but it's been fantastic. And we really um, have kind of, we've really been connected to two ideas that have gave us the motivation to, to really do this and um, shape what All Together is all about. And the first is storytelling. We think that everything comes back to storytelling and celebrating a place through its people. And this really transcends geographic areas. You know, we've worked for large regional entities to downtowns, corridors, all the way down to development sites or those these micro sites and alleyways. And um, it doesn't really matter the scale. Um, in any project, we have found that it's really important to have an authentic story behind it, to engage the community and to, to, to be able to design and present something that's inspirational so people can think about what could be in their community. Um, and then our, our second big value is really just creating and designing joyful experiences. This has been important really in, in everything that we do, uh, but especially so much over, over the past year, everyone needs some joy in their lives. And so a lot of the projects that we'll talk to and show you today really focus on that theme. And I think that um, for us and it all to get together, it's really about um, not only in what we design in, the, in our projects, but um, our firm and our culture. So we wanna make sure that it is all about joy and making sure it's sustainable to be you know, a part of this business that that is fun. And I think that that's really relevant for anyone who's on this call right now, you know, it's developers, planners, designers, it's it's a tough time. And I think the stakes are high to, to create and design and plan for these really meaningful, impactful places. Um, and so I think it's easy to lose sight of why we're doing this or to become burnt out. And so I think joy is a really defining theme for all of us. And Rachel will talk more about that in a little bit. Great. Um, and Rachel, uh, could you tell us a little bit about what drew you to this work? Of course, I'm the first person to be like, oh, you're muted. <laughs> but I got it. Um, yeah, so for for us, like Marisa said, this, this idea of joy, um, I read this book, we both read this book by Ingrid Fettel Lee called Joyful. And it's all about the um, power of design and aesthetics to make moments of joy. And so it's broken down into a few different categories like energy, which is light and color, abundance, freedom, harmony, play. Um, there's all these different things. And, and reading that book just made me realize how much that's all lacking in the public space. Um, you know, there you go outside and it's just so much gray and it feels like such a missed opportunity to, you know, you know, bring color and life into public spaces and the impact that can have. And so, um, you know, I was just really excited to launch something and use my design background and races incredible stories to help communities, you know, tell their story and, and bring some more, you know, light and positivity to public places. And then I know we were going to talk a little bit more about other joyful things. I can, um, the author, Laura, is Ingrid Fettel Lee, and the book is Joyful. So I have other examples, but I don't know if you want me to talk more about that or just what made me want to launch all together. Well, thank you, Rachel. Our next question is for Marisa and Rachel specifically. And this kind of build upon this joyful interventions that you talk about and have talked about today. When you talk about inspiring joy in people, often this is a moment in time, but you say that it can lead to larger projects and interventions to, to improve our environment over a long time period. Can you talk about how your projects inspire joy, why it's important and how this has led to greater change over time. Thank yeah, you. sure. Um, so, you know, one of the examples in this, this book that I mentioned that's really just powerful about like the, the psychology and how it changes a place over time was um, the city in Albania called Tirana. And in 2000, a new mayor was elected to, to run the city that was full of corruption and crime and distrust and very few resources. Um, but his background was in art. And so his first act in office was to paint buildings all over the city in these vibrant colors, orange and pink and blue. And at first people were like, okay, what are you doing? 
Um, but then like it changed people. People stopped littering. They started paying their taxes and feeling safer on the streets, even though nothing really changed about you know the crime. But people removed the metal gates from buildings and started going to cafes and imagining a different type of city. And all of that was just color. Like there was no major influx of capital and it created this snowball effect of how residents saw and treated their own city. And so that's really the power that we see in this, that joy is infectious and that once you see it, you spread it. Um, and so we, we see joy as a type of um, service that communities and governments can provide. Um, you know, and that the, the long term change might not necessarily be in the physical, but in like the um, psychology and identity of the people who live there and the connections that they have to their place. And that's a really long term impact. Um, I'll show we have a few projects that we can talk about that kind of showcase some of the work that we're doing. And um, of course, I need to let me try that again. Here we go. You full screen. So this is a project, um, one of the first projects that we did when we launched, which was in um, July, as Marisa said, it was businesses were just starting to open and everyone was still afraid about going to businesses. And you know, this is in Central Street in Evanston. And as Marisha will talk about more, our clients there are amazing. Laura Brown and Annie Coakley um, from Evanston. And we brought them this idea of like, let's just bring joy to Central Street. And we painted these rainbow stripes on the sidewalk and created these fringe to hang from the trees that are this kind of like um, recycled plastic material and then had this whole campaign around joy and engaging the businesses on what, you know, what brings them joy and what is their, like, what do they hope to spark in, in people and bringing them joy as well. So I'm saying joy a lot of times, but it's important to us. So, you know, the, and when we were putting these down, like the impact was immediate. Like there was this woman with her kid, you know, it was like, oh, is this, what is this for? And it's like, oh, it's just, it's just really to make you smile. And she's just like, wow, it's working. Like it, and there was like mail carriers who we would run into when we were taking down the fringe, they were just like, oh, is this leaving? Like, we've loved it so much. It makes us smile so much. And like that, it really just, it was the first, Thing that this SSA, this new SSA did. And it helps people to, first of all, know that this is, you know, this is an entity that is doing good things in this neighborhood and really connected people to the neighborhood and this business district and helped create, like, it's helping to add to the identity of this place and how they're thinking about future events and future investments in their, in their neighborhood. Is that like, we are Central Street, we are a place that, you know, we can all come together and find each other um, in these hard times. So, um, and then, you know, in other projects as well, where we created a brand and some banners for um, Clark Street in Rogers Park and the banners, you know, we just really wanted to have a ton of color on the street because it's such a vibrant neighborhood. And so, you know, designing those to really max out this color palette and have there be like all this light on the street um, was really the goal for that. And I think we'll pause there and can give someone else a chance to talk. Great, thank you for sharing that. Um, and um, my next question is for Amanda. Uh, public art master planning is one of your core services at Designing Local. You've done public art master plans in Fort Wayne, Indiana, Frisco, Texas, Montpelier, Vermont, just to name a few. Um, so what do you think um, are the benefits of planning for public art rather than just relying on your local arts organizations or providing grants? And you touched on this in the beginning, but if you could elaborate on that. Sure. Um, you know, I think now more than ever, we're finding how much value public art brings to public spaces. And just like Rachel and Marisa have shared, uh, you know, it really does bring joy to people. Um, but without policy, without a funding mechanism, without a way to maintain that art, it's really difficult for cities to get them on the ground. So a lot of times these nonprofits or arts councils or business improvement districts or SIDS or whatever they are in your community are the ones who are kind of stepping in front of that for cities that don't have those programs and providing that service to the community. Um, we know that nonprofits have a hard time raising money on their own already. And so, um, I think it's really important to remember and understand and believe that municipal municipalities have a role in helping fund those initiatives, that these nonprofits can't be the only ones 
uh, that are funding these initiatives that do bring so much color and joy to communities. Um, so our firm really focuses on understanding um, you know, best practices on a national level, right? So public art programs have been around uh, since the 70s and 80s, and there are tried and true methods for uh, beginning a public art program and running those programs and making sure that they're operational and that they're running well. But we also know that one size does not fit all uh, in, in any case, and the same is true for um, a public art programs and also just arts and culture programming at a municipal level. So just because one funding mechanism has worked for 30 years in a large city doesn't mean that it's going to work in a small city um, who perhaps is shrinking or losing population or is recovering from, um, you know, uh, lost industry, right? So there are all these different um, uh, aspects that we have to consider when we're developing these programs for cities. Uh, so when we first start um, kind of getting to know these communities, we want to understand what it is that the community wants. So we have clients who are interested in focusing on uh, enabling local artists to be uh, the public artists in their communities and are not interested in having national artists come in and develop public art pieces for their cities. Uh, in those contexts, the program looks really different than, than clients who want um, a national or international kind of profile when it comes to their public art collection. And therefore, the approach is really different. Um, you know, if you've got if you've got a, a community who is very interested in national or international artists, it's likely that you're going to need a higher uh, dollar threshold to be able to commission those artists because they're traveling. Um, it's likely that they uh, have a higher price point than your local artist. Um, so, so we're developing a funding mechanism for those places, but we're also thinking about how that artist is selected to do and create the work for these public spaces. Uh, and, and all of you work with boards and commissions regularly, so you understand um, how difficult personalities can be sometimes uh, and, and how, um, how a process, how important a process is to put in place so that the city is safeguarded against decisions that their commissions uh, are making and, and so that they can defend uh, public spending. So uh, we help communities kind of set up those commissions and, and the process to then get community members to be involved in the selection of artists. Um, you know, we find often in those communities that want internationally and nationally known public artists that they also feel that only people who are in the art sphere should be involved in helping select the public art. And all of us know that that is not true. Um, art is not for people who can afford to go to museums or who can afford to travel uh, and see art, right? Public art that's paid for by a city should be for everybody. And um, arts administrators who work in museums are really wonderful and they've been trained, but those may not be the people who are going to be receiving and loving those pieces of art that are going into our neighborhoods and into our parks that are within neighborhoods. So we help cities understand that balance of uh, you know, we really want high quality trained eyes selecting the art that we're uh, commissioning and and the balance of, well, you also need representation from communities and not only uh, geographic representation, but uh, racial and economic uh, um, representation as well. Uh, because we find that when we're helping communities set up these selection panels that are diverse, the outcomes and the people that are selected to create that artwork are also diverse. Therefore, the whole collection is diverse. And everything that a city uh, is putting out in the public realm should be an opportunity for people to see themselves and what they're investing in. And art is no different. Um, you know, so again, to, to wrap up the question about public art planning, uh, all those things are really important for a city to think about when there's when they say, we want public art. Uh, it's not just, you don't snap your fingers and you have a beautiful mural uh, painted on a building and you don't snap your fingers and have the bean uh, in a new park, right? Those things are very carefully planned. Um, many times it takes two to five years to get those pieces of public art into, uh, into a site and it takes multiple uh, rounds of you know, conversation with an engineering department, a public service department, and um, we help cities set up those processes so it doesn't feel like you're picking up something that isn't solid. Uh, and and it's, uh, it is a very 
tedious process, but well worth it once the plans have been adopted and are put into place. Very interesting. Thank you, Amanda. I think I probably came in thinking any public art is good art. And I didn't give a lot of thought to who is receiving that art. That's really interesting to think about. I'm going to jump back and ask Rachel and Marisa another question. Rachel, you talked about these uh, events or projects as being something that spark joy and change the psychology or the spirit of a community that then leads like a chain reaction um, to other projects or feelings, changes in psychology or spirit, um, almost that they are contagious. And speaking of contagious, we have coronavirus that we've been dealing with as a world. Um, I'm sure that programming has felt different um, because of coronavirus and you've started your firm during coronavirus. Um, and so this year there have been fewer avenues for social interaction and gathering in the community. What social space programming have you undertaken during COVID that has been the most impactful, um, that has created positivity and connection even during this challenging time? Thank you, Nolan. Um, and I'm so sorry. My neighbors decided to sand some wood at this point. So hopefully you can still hear me and it will be short. Gotta love the flexibility of working from home. I'm like, stop it. Um, so it's a really good question. And I think that, um, I mean, of course, programming, it has changed. And I think that when we started all together, our primary service was going to be around community branding and engagement always with placemaking as kind of this tertiary offering, you know, that we would bring to projects. And what happened um, in a really interesting way is that it, it rose to kind of our primary service because there were a lot of these um, cities and SSAs, downtown organizations, chambers who had, were rethinking like, what do we do now? How do we have an event when you can't have an event in groups of people out there? And a lot of them had this pot of money that was reserved for events. And so we have been working with them to think creatively about, okay, well, what is, what is an event and what is the real meaning of an event? It's to get people together in some way, um, economic development to help you know, bring, bring foot traffic along some of our corridors and avenues and get people out and about and shopping and to feel connected to their community. And this can still happen even with the constraints of, of COVID. And so one example that I wanted to talk about today is um, one of our, our programs that we're in the middle of right now um, in Evanston. And we're talking a lot about some of our work in Evanston because we have honestly just amazing partners there um, with downtown Evanston, their, their downtown organization, Annie Coakley, Coakley and, and Laura Brown. And so Annie came to us one day and was like, look it, we've done, we, you know, we just had a really successful event downtown we need to take this citywide and we need to rethink like everyone is going to lose it in February. We're all inside. A lot of us have our kids home. You know, the, the Evanston School District just went back yesterday at a very hybrid uh, level and everyone is on screens and mental health is really suffering in the community, physical activity, like no one's getting out and walking around or doing anything. What can we do and what can we offer? And so we came up with this program, a month long program called Winter Games. And it really helped to achieve the goals of getting people off screens and outside and connected to um, programming, helping to support some of the local businesses who are in kind of dire straits right now. Um, and then thinking about how we can bring people together as a community and, and structure some events um, around that. So for the programming piece, and Rachel have you kind of go to the next slide, um, you know, you find a lot of times in communities that there's different partners who are doing really interesting event work, but in different realms. So you have the city who's hosting events, you have the different organizations, um, you know, like whether that's the Main Street organizations or the SSAs, um, different corridors. And so, you know, you can combine it all in a calendar, but oftentimes people don't really understand and can tap into everything that's going on. 
And the city of Evanston is no stranger to this. I mean, they're, they're, they're trying to do a lot of different activities and programming. So our first step at this was really like, how do we combine all of the programs that are going on right now and make it accessible to everyone? And we did that um, under the umbrella of Winter Games, but through a digital scavenger hunt. Um, it's called Event C. Rachel's going to talk about it in a little bit for another one of our projects. Um, but it really is a wonderful way to get people out and experiencing this programming and they earn points the more activities that they do. So that was kind of the first thing, just getting people outside and incentivizing it. We had um, four major sponsors who donated thousands of dollars to make this happen, as well as thousands of dollars in prizes. So um, I think it's really an incentive for people to get out and participate. And when you register, you're assigned a team color. So each of the sponsors has a team. So it's kind of playing into that competitive spirit. Um, and then for the shop local, what we did is we have three um, participating business districts. Um, now actually four. And so um, all of the different uh, businesses were assigned a color and we gave them LED lights that they strung up on their storefront. And um, so you get double points if let's say I'm assigned to team blue and I stop and get a coffee from Backlot and their team blue, then I get double points. And so it's really encouraging people to, you know, rack up these points, shop local, and it's been incredibly successful. We've had hundreds of people playing and the businesses have seen an uptick. A lot of people are coming in and they're like, you're team blue, right? Okay, awesome. Okay, good. Like I'm team blue, blue too. Um, so it's, it's been really successful in terms of just getting people out and um, where traditionally they probably would have been home in February. Um, because, you know, we as a, um, at least in Chicago, I can't say for everyone, and I'm also from Michigan, you know, we talk a big game about winter, but we are wimps, and we all go into hibernation come, you know, January, and then we, with our red wine, and we re-emerge come spring when kids are like six inches taller, and it's like, where did those three months go? Um, and so, and there's a big, you know, winter cities movement around this. But this, um, this program was really that opportunity, I think, to, to even dis despite and COVID and maybe because of COVID, think about ways that we could restructure. Um, and the last thing that I wanted just to say about Winter Games is are the events. So we, you know, it's, it's very much go out and do it on your own with your mask and your own time. Um, so we've been trying to think about our activation structured in that way. It's not your typical like come out for two hours for the 4th of July parade. It's a month long where you can come out when it's flexible for you when you feel okay and safe to do so. Um, and so that's why Winter Games was structured to be a month long. Um, but we also have been incorporating outdoor, you know, socially distanced events. And um, it's been a wonderful way to get the community together. We we're doing a blood drive. Um, last week they did like a, you pick up a, a bag um, for a homeless shelter and you fill it up and give it back. And of course you can earn points for that, but also be part of kind of this larger community volunteerism, um, which is really at the heart of, of the city of Evanston, I think. And um, we have uh, a huge, this weekend, a huge um, ice sculpting event where you can bring your kids out and um, to Fountain Square, which is the heart of downtown and um, experience, you know, ice sculpting, get your kids involved, show them they can get off the screens and have fun. Um, and then yesterday we just did a, uh, the Temperance, which is a local brewery here, just worked with um, kind of winter games to coincide it and launched a new beer and 100% of the proceeds as, it, as they, it runs through Winter Games will go directly back into the city of Evanston's reparations fund. So we had um, kind of you know, sold out tickets to that yesterday. And so really, I think that this event just, it brought all of those different pieces together and it's shown communities that um, it's time to rethink the way that, that we do events and um, you know, we're probably gonna be dealing with COVID for a while longer and, and mask wearing and socially distanced. So not just for the next year, but I think it's a real opportunity for communities to rethink the way that they're engaging their community. Great. Thank you so much, Marissa. Yeah, that sounds like a really great event. Yeah. Um, and Amanda, um, I've got another question for you. So one document of yours that I really love is the Sandus Sandusky placemaking concepts. Um, 
So you developed that um, for the city of Sandusky with some really creative concepts for public art and space activation that are rooted in the city's history and culture. Um, can you talk about the document itself and the concepts that you developed and how you developed them? Sure. Um, so one of the things we do when we first start a project, uh, we always ask people, what kinds of public art would you like in your community? Literally, we get 100 people saying they want the bean. And we're like, do you know how much that costs? And they're like, yeah, like a couple hundred thousand dollars. We're like, no, like $25 million. And they're like, Oh, so then you have to start asking uh, deeper questions so that they can begin to understand why they like the bean. Uh, they love the bean because of all the pictures that inundate their social media sites. They love the bean because it is synonymous with Chicago and it has become a brand, right? And we can point to a few other public art pieces in the world, but because this is CNU Midwest and because you guys are in Chicago, we have to say, you know, we have to bring recognition to the bean. Um, so we have to have some, we do some work kind of undoing some uh, desires and kind of value um, systems that people have around public art because it's important for them to understand, yeah, the bean's fantastic, but you don't want to hire the same artist to develop a different shape because it's not going to be iconic because it's not special to you, right? You still can achieve some of those things and people might recognize that it's the same artist, but that's not you know, what we're trying to do here. We really want to create some uh, concepts that are unique to you. So I'm going to go ahead and just share um, uh, this window here. I'm going to go ahead and make it full screen so we can kind of um, click through. Um, so to begin having those conversations, we have to ask folks, what is special about your community, right? So what are those special pieces of history uh, that should be celebrated and that are different from your neighbors, uh, from, you know, other cities in your state and, you know, in this case, the world. So uh, the city of Sandusky is actually on a, a triangular grid, right? There are two other cities in the world that are, and that is super special. Um, it's because of the, the presence of the Masons, which, you know, people have their own opinions about the Masons, but it's still nonetheless a very special quality that should, uh, you know, be at least acknowledged, right? Maybe not celebrated or it should be at least acknowledged. So, um, you know, we also try to help people think about different sites that could be energized or, um, you know, made more interesting or unique through an investment in public art. So, uh, you know, we, we show some concept sketches and we think about what those special things are and then we integrate those into, um, you know, some ideas that we can show the city and also show the community. One of those things that uh, we're constantly kind of working against is people thinking that they have to have exactly what they've seen somewhere else because they can't possibly understand how an artist can create something even more beautiful than the thing they saw somewhere else. Um, so these renderings are not really meant to say you have to do this exact concept. It's really just to say, hey, look, you know, we listened to what you said. We heard you that the, the triangular grid was super important, that you want to energize this uh, overpass that's you know, quite dangerous and not well lit. Um, and you want it to be a gateway, right? You have a ton of visitors, millions of people coming to Sandusky to go to Cedar Point, and this is the way that they're coming. Uh, and so here's a concept that you could use. People get really pumped about that. Um, one of the other things about Sandusky is that they're right on the lake, right? So I personally love like all the fun kind of nautical um, uh, myths and mythology. And I, I think a lot of people really enjoy that. And so, uh, you know, people talk about Lemmy, the Lake Erie monster. It's kind of like, it's like Loch Ness's cousin, but it's Lemmy. So why not have this like really fantastic, super fun park that acknowledges the, the mythology of this lake. Like there's all these sightings, these historic sightings of this Lemmy monster. It's so fun, right? So, you know, got some uh, cargo ship um, you know, play structures over here on the right, and there's a ship, and kids are, you know, you know, playing in this uh, playground. It has slides, right? So, you know, these are just thoughts about how they can integrate some of these special things and not just purchase a playground out of a catalog. Um, you know, one of our uh, other favorite things 
that we helped the city think through here. Um, the old American Crayon Company was in Sandusky and it was torn down. It was this beautiful building that you can see down here on the bottom left. It was torn down um, and I can't remember what's going on the site, but that was a huge employer in the community for many, many years. Uh, and so why not create some kind of super fun fountain that looks like some giant just threw his crayons down when he was running away from this the American Crayon Factory, right? So there are tons of different things that you can do. Um, you know, another concept was to do these like really wonderful walleye uh, fish that are kind of swimming down toward Lake Erie. These are above kind of the sight lines of these folks that uh, have second story apartments and condos and things, so it won't block their view of the lake, but it still energizes and, you know, brings something of interest to these places. Um, you know, we do this in a lot of different communities and we do it in a lot of different ways, but the, at the heart of it is really discovering what those special things are and really helping them kind of flush out how those things might be translated by artists into the built environment. And again, I want to make sure that everyone hears me that, um, you know, these are just concepts because ultimately we are advocates for hiring public artists to develop their own concepts, but we do find value and our clients find significant value in helping the community and elected officials understand what public art might look like in a space, uh, which is why we provide some of these concepts to them. It also helps them go after grants. Um, you know, and, and really make some of these projects, I think, uh, be funded uh, in the near term rather than in the long term. And I should also say that, um, you know, in the, in the communities where we are purely there from a policy standpoint, those are great plans, but sometimes uh, people have a, a hard time kind of saying, okay, well, the policies are here, the funding mechanism is generating money, what's next? What do we, how do we even move from, we have a commission, we have a funding mechanism, our policies are doing well, we know we're going to generate this much, but we, we need to think about what's next. And we need people to, to buy into the thing that's next before they buy into that first uh, bite of a program. Um, and I could go on and on, but I will stop there. Great. Thanks so much, Amanda. Thanks, Amanda. I'm seeing... I'm seeing the connections between designing local and all together that, that there is this joy and um, storytelling going on at both of your firms. That's so exciting. And I think it's really interesting. You're, you're using public art or encouraging public art that's telling stories that maybe people know about their communities. Maybe people don't know about their communities. I'm thinking, I went to school in Dayton, Ohio. And there's a sculpture of a giant ice cube tray. And I'm like, what is this? Well, I guess Dayton, uh, some innovator in Dayton invented the self-release ice cube tray. And, and so I, I learned something through this public art um, about the city that I lived in. So I think that's, I think that's really cool. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask a question back to um, Marisa and Rachel. Marisa, I was really enthused when you were talking about these teams uh, competing against each other. So creating this joy in a little bit of friendly competition. Um, I, my next question is um, focused on developing activities um, that encourage people in a community to interact with their surroundings. Um, what is the role of aesthetics, what is the role of design um, in these activities and, and projects? What Marisa didn't mention is that she was incredibly competitive. So she has that insight oh. to how to design games that would get people involved. Because she's like, my family's team blue and team blue is going to win. <laughs> Uh, I'm missing yeah, all. Like <laughs> but um, in terms of you know the the goals of getting people to interact with their environment, um, you know we it's kind of twofold for us. We really want to focus on sparking positivity and playfulness in people, and then also supporting local businesses. Like that's really what it all comes back to. Is like how do we get people to come out and realize that they're part of a community that all of these all businesses are part of, and that like when we're all working together, it just works better. Um, so there's a few projects that I want to talk about that that really, 
you know, focus on that and, and get people engaging with the public environment, but also with the businesses that are in that environment. Um, and so the first one is we did a project called Make Lemonade. So it was in November, everyone was, um, you know, pretty anxious. And it, we just tried to create, you know, another way to catch people's attention is like we said through color. So like, we just, we had these phrases up that were like kind of quirky and fun, but also were just supposed to make you smile. Um, you know, obviously Marisa is a copywriter and so she wrote really cute phrases, but you know, we had just, you know, reminders of like shop small, support local, make lemonade. And then these bright kind of spots of um, color. We had these panels created and painted them this you know bright yellow color and um, you know these tires with yellow mums in them and so it just brought a lot of light and playfulness and, and you know got people wondering like what is what is this like, what is it about um, and it connected to this, this it was also through events you where there were all these different clues about the businesses that were participating and the participating businesses, I think I had a picture here, that had lemons in their windows. And so if you saw lemons and you, you know, this was advertised through the, the city and the downtown social media, you know, you knew that they were a participating business. And then you had to like find their QR code and take a picture to, to get the points in the app that you had found this business. And then you got additional points if you bought something and could submit a receipt for it. So it's not just exploring the local environment, but also encouraging, um, you know, additional supporting of the businesses. And then there was this um, picture in the downtown uh, that was, you know, as community participated and there were sales and the businesses, the picture started to fill up. And so it was a visual reminder of like, hey, there's this thing going on and you can be part of it. And so really finding opportunities um, in public spaces and, you know, the businesses are so great. Like they want something to, an, another reason to get people out and were, you know, had created custom cocktails or menu items that was like around the idea of lemonade. Um, and then also just like a reason for people to play. Like we did a few of these hopscotch um, setups where, you know, it's duct tape and chalk spray paint. It's not fancy. But it's just if you like we installed this one in Fountain Square within like 10 minutes of putting it down, there were some college students who were like, I'll play hopscotch. Like, why not? Like, it, there's just it, it's a reason to remind you that it's OK to still be a kid and still, um, you know, play in that way. And then, you know, of course, in, in the app, if you take a picture of, you know, you're doing hopscotch, you, you get, you know, points. And so um, I think another really important thing with these is just making sure that there's a connection. So we're doing these public space interventions where we're putting up the bunting and we've got these fun panels. Um, but like, how do people know that this is connected, that this ha what's happening in the physical is connected to this digital game? And so, you know, we use the hashtag make lemonade and like it's, uh, you know, posters and signs around just to make sure that people can, the QR codes, people are connecting like, oh, this, if I scan this, then it takes me to this website that tells me there's this game I'm supposed to be participating in. So making sure that people can find out, um, you know, I see this thing happening in public, but it must be connected in something. And if I do a little, like a, there's a way for me to find out more pretty easily. Um, this is also like a fun little maze on the sidewalk that we did, that was fun. Um, Another one that we worked on in Uptown was called Winter Warmth in Uptown. And so um, in the Uptown neighborhood, they usually have a event called uh, Winter Warmth on Wilson, or no, it's called, usually called Winter Walk on Wilson. And it's a music festival type thing that couldn't happen, but they still wanted to give the businesses this support. And so, you know, we created all of these custom stencils that had these messages of positivity and, and you know, embrace the idea that we can create our own warmth, even in the winter, even in Chicago, we can have warmth on Wilson. And we also hung these really sparkly fringes. It's, it's hard to capture in a picture, but like when you saw all of them down the street, they just sparkled in the most magical way. Um, and again, it encourages people to share it, to see this message and the way that joy is infectious. Like, I wanna take a picture of this and I'm gonna share it because it made me smile. And that that's another way you know, to, to tie it back and share what's, what's happening as well as more traditional things like social media. And so we make sure it's connected to a social campaign where you know, each week in the month of December, there was a, a different theme around the idea of 
warmth, whether it's, um, you know, t shopping local businesses, donating to local um, nonprofits, um, you know, getting takeout from local restaurants. Um, so all of these different themes for each week. And then, you know, all the sharing of like when other people are out there and, and using the hashtag and using it, making sure that you're, you're capturing all that and sharing all that. Um, you know, we, the color is, I think, the main way that we get people's attention and let people know that something's happening. And so, you know, Lunar New Year is happening right now. This is up right now. But it's the, the Red Lanterns are just synonymous with Lunar New Year. And so finding um, way this, there have this whole digital um, Lunar New Year celebration. It's this Saturday. You should check it out if you're in Chicago. I guess you're anywhere because it's Lunar New Year, so or it's virtual, so you can celebrate it from anywhere. But, you know, having something in the physical world to connect to digital programming is really important in this time where we're still having to do so much virtual programming. It's really helpful to have that physical reminder that something is happening and that you should look into it and then have the information there for you to be able to, to look into it a little bit more. So those are some of the projects. I think those were kind of all of my notes for that. But yeah, I think that we found, um, Q, we were talking to someone else, QR codes really made a comeback. Like who would have thought two years ago, QR codes, so hot, but they're really useful and people finally know how to use them. Marisa just learned, so. <laughs> <laughs> That's great, thank you so much. Um, um, so I, I do uh, have a question for all of you. Um, we, you know, we can, we can guess that local government budgets are going to come into a challenging time, um, coming into a generally challenging economic time. I mean, we know that arts and culture frequently see budget cuts during this kind of context. Um, so if you were going to give communities some advice on some low cost ways they might be able to sort of implement some place making activities, um, whether that be public art, whether that be programming. Um, could you just sort of give us your thoughts on that? And uh, we'll start with uh, Marisa on that one. Um, I think that, you know, all that we do is, is pretty cheap. And it is, um, it's our time. That's probably the most expensive, but all the materials we use are, are pretty cheap. So I think for low cost interventions, it's, it's a really easy way to work with that. And I think Rachel can probably add more to that in a little bit. But one thing that I wanna think about is, you know, um, in terms of art and public art, whether that's longer term or short term temporary activations and pop-ups, I think that there is, there's a shift in thinking and even at the federal level in terms of um, what is economic development and community development. And whereas before public art or what we're doing almost seemed a little frivolous, um, it's now being taken much more seriously. And people are understanding the huge impact that even these small scale interventions have for the community and for the future of the community and for longer term investments. And I know like as an example, I'm working with a client right now um, on, a, on an application for through the federal government for a relief act um, for a grant for economic development and making the case for public art and for programming like we're talking about um, as a very easy way to get people out and supporting local and feeling like they're part of, of a community. So I think you can think small, but I think you can also think big in terms of different funding mechanisms to get this stuff off the ground, but also maintain it, which I know was a question that came through, I think by Samantha, um, that there's a lot of different ways to approach it. Great, um, and Amanda, you know, I'm sure that, that some low cost interventions come through in some of your plans, but do you have um, any advice for attendees about what, you know, any project that they can do in sort of a, in sort of a constrained resource kind of environment? Well, the good news is for cities who already have some of these public art policies in place, the policy doesn't change. So the funding will still be coming in and your funding is restricted to spend on public art. Um, and, you know, we have a client right now um, who put quite a substantial amount of money toward public art in a uh, street re rehabilitation program that is going to be doing a, a lot more temporary projects. And um, part of the angle for them putting in so much money toward 
the public art along that corridor was talking about the recovery of artists, right? We're talking about the recovery of businesses uh, post COVID and the recovery of our general funds, but these artists have been completely obliterated. I mean, if you follow any artist on Instagram, I mean, they are, um, a lot of them are talking about fatigue and how much content they're having to create to stay relevant. And also like so many of them have not booked shows for 2021. So when you talk um, about investment and public art, it's great. Like, sure, yes, you want to have the outcome of the art itself. But um, I think that we need to shift our conversation into talking about economic recovery for our artists, because we know it's not only about the things that they're injecting into the built environment, but it is into their, uh, I don't know, into their kids' schoolwork, right? Into their communities, um, into the products that they're selling online or just the thought process that artists bring to different things. And so um, when we begin to talk about spending money on public art, it's not just the art that we're bringing, right? It's uh, economic resources to artists themselves. And I think that that is something that um, all of us need to begin talking about. And some of that CARES Act money that our cities are getting will be, that will be an allowable expenditure. Um, so uh, you know, I think that's really important to know too. And I would say, you know, our firm anticipated that uh, work would slow at the end of last year. So like the opportunities would become less for us. And we have found the opposite. Um, and I think it's because of what Marisa said and that cities are like, oh, I should pay attention to this. This is our opportunity to make sure that representation is done well and that we get it right. And I think for the first time as a society, we're able to pause and think about what our new democracy looks like. And that does look like making sure that arts and culture are not just for elitist white people as it has been in the past, but it's for everybody. Um, and I think cities are a major partner in making that happen. I think also, I mean, one of the things that Marisa touched on earlier was just, you know, getting sponsors for some of these things is like, if you're talking about public art and programming as a benefit to community health, mental health, equity, those are things that a lot of companies, local companies want to invest in. And so I think it's really framing what you're doing um, in a way that can, you can get private dollars to also help some of that. Um, and to tie this in with a question that this isn't, this isn't kind of related to a resource constrained environment, but one of our um, attendees had a question about when you've got any programs that require kind of an ongoing maintenance of funding, um, sort of um, that this is kind of a, a question to ask at any time, you know what I mean, not going through the time that we're going in, but how, how do you think about funding when it, in terms of ongoing maintenance, I probably a lot of your projects or are cap a one time capital investment I don't know if you've worked on projects that have ongoing sort of operational funding but um, how have you addressed that in the past and maybe if you can give some examples. And um, does that would anyone like to start does anyone have anything um, on the tip of their tongue. Sure yeah I can start. Um, I mean, with most of our activations so far have been, um, you know, four to eight weeks. And so part of our fee, our part of our job in creating this is the maintenance. So going to check on it, making sure, fixing things. Like when you're doing things in public spaces, they need someone to be a caretaker. And so that's usually our role is both like checking in on it, fixing things, making updates, making sure that everything is working the way it needs to be working and then taking it down. Um, and so that's, you know, part of our services is that ongoing, like, we're not just going to install something, we're going to stay with you throughout the process and make sure that it, you know, stays nice looking. Um, for longer term public art, you know, a lot of that can be taken care of in your policy. And when you have an artist who has been commissioned, they should be providing you with a maintenance plan. And that maintenance plan should have some specific dollar amounts and years that you're providing that maintenance service. And therefore the uh, the, the fund that is generating the funding for the public art program, the policy should be broad enough to allow for maintenance to be an allowable expenditure so that you can pay for ongoing maintenance of pieces. Um, and, and, you know, we, when we're writing policies for our clients, we, the majority of our clients aren't flush with cash, right? So um, they're not saying like, yeah, we'll take a, a piece that's going to need significant maintenance, right? Like we have clients who are like, we really need the maintenance to be happening every six years to 10 years, right? Other than a quick wash off. 
Um, but many programs don't require the artist to provide a maintenance plan for those pieces. And, and we write our policy such that it is required so the city can anticipate that. For projects that have that are older and you have some issues with the pieces, I would suggest reaching out to a conservator and having your entire collection assessed only because um, that conservator can give you an accurate amount uh, as to how much you can expect to spend. And if it is not going to be something that you can spend within the next five years, it could be beneficial uh, to the city to get that piece out of the public just for a limited amount of time to protect it from further deterioration uh, until you can fix it and bring it back out into the public. Um, so there are a lot of things about maintenance that are super nuanced, but um, it's a very important question that absolutely should be addressed. Jocelyn, I had another question for the guests today, um, but it is 4 till 1 p.m. I just wanted to yeah, it's okay. Uh, if, we go, if we go over, we go over sometimes with the questions. And today, I would like to um, commend our attendees. We've got a lot of really great questions today, so um, we'll go a little bit over in time. Okay, thanks. Um, so this question relates back to some things that Amanda had spoken about regarding who is receiving the art, um, who is the artist, uh, what group do they represent, or, or how do they associate, and um, making sure that we are intentional about um, creating these spaces um, in this democracy. So th this question relates to that idea. Um, when you are activating spaces and making them destinations, how do you keep those spaces democratic instead of just appealing to a particular demographic? That's a great question that everyone everywhere is grappling with. Um, and I think sometimes we get paralysis because we think so much about it, but sometimes you just have to invest in something and get it out there and know that the next thing is going to appeal to a different demographic. The first and most important thing to know about public art and art in general is that it's not for everybody. It should be approachable by everybody, but not everyone is going to like everything that you put out there. And that is okay, right? That is the, the first thing that we're all stepping out with. Um, but I think that it's really important to understand geographically who lives around the piece that you're placing uh, and commissioning, and then who the artist is, right? Because, um, you know, we, we recently ran a call for a half a million dollar piece of art over, we had 150 applications, uh, over 115 of those were white guys many of them over 40, right? So, but that's because they've had access to creating really wonderful public art. And that has been what public art has looked like in our country forever, but that is changing. And so when, when we're selecting who the artists are, we need to be mindful of who the artists are because they are ultimately going to be creating artwork that is more reflective of people who look like them uh, and people who aren't necessarily like white old guys. So, um, I think it's really important to think about it from from a you know all different perspectives. So where's it going? Who is you know most often going to access the piece? Who is the artist? Uh, do they look like the people who the art is going to be around? And then what does their art look like? And is it the right piece to go in that place? Um, and then I think sometimes and I I'm saying this and I'm sure some people that I'm working for are on this. Um, webinar, but sometimes with public funding to step into this next phase of, of who we are as a country, we have to kind of swallow the things that we've done in the past and say like, that didn't work. That system was built and it was broken when we built it. So like our procurement practices may not be relevant as we move forward. And we can't always say like in order for someone to be hired to create public art, they have to have been commissioned to do a project of this scale at X amount of dollars, because we know that that is just, that's not reality for, for artists of color and women artists. And so um, I think we have to be willing to make some changes and some concessions that don't feel safe, but will feel safe if we do them more often. 
So we're using muscles that we haven't been used to using, but it's time to begin to use those so that they are used to making decisions that don't feel safe based on our past experience. I mean, I think that was phenomenal. I think it's, I don't have much to add to that. It was really well said, Amanda. Um, but I do think in terms of our type of work and some of the more temporary activations, that's where the programming comes in. Um, again, talking about winter games, thinking about four pretty different business districts, three really um, in Evanston um, with, you know, Evanston is a wonderful community, but pretty, you know, the, each of the neighborhoods are socioeconomically not very diverse. And so I think that it's a reason to make creating a reason for people to leave their neighborhood and to go experience that art for the programming. And you have to be really creative and you have to kind of keep it fresh like we did with Uptown, you know, the programming can get very, very stale. And so I think it's constantly staying ahead of that and thinking what is going to get people out, what are the incentives so that they can either go visit this art, experience it, or be a part of this larger community. And, and that's even more challenging right now because everyone's hunkered down at home and not leaving their neighborhoods. So it's really trying to stay fresh in that sense. And I, I just have one thing to add. I know we're getting close to the end of time, but one of the ways that I think cities can still accomplish uh, some of these goals is temporary art is the, is the new thing. You heard it here first, everybody. Like it is the new thing. Permanence is expensive and it should be because it's meant to last, but temporary um, is cheaper and it provides an opportunity for people who want to be public artists who don't have access to a giant shop to create a, you know, a giant sculpture with lights. That is, that is important and there's a place for that. But temporary art provides an avenue to accomplish a lot of the things that we're talking about with a limited and low budget for, you know, what many may call frivolous, but also provides an opportunity for cities and uh, commissioning agencies to provide opportunities to people who haven't had the opportunity, which should be at the forefront of everything that we do right now. It kind of reminds me of like a, um, like an incubator kitchen or something, um, giving people an opportunity to, uh, reducing some of those barriers to entry. Um, through temporary works. Yeah, very interesting. And Marisa, you uh, thinking about democracy and democratic access to spaces, you've written about um, designing cities for with women in mind, right? Yes, I did. And how does that how does that influence your thinking when thinking of creating these spaces that are, are democratic, um, maybe not designed for just one demographic. Yeah, I mean, I think for a long time, and this speaks to like the, the, the uh, what Amanda was talking about, generally, there were, for public spaces, they were being designed by people who were not necessarily using those spaces. Um, and so there were a lot of things that were missed. Um, and, and this is still going on um, around the world, less so kind of here in the United States, but very much so on an international scale where you have um, a lot of, you know, older white men who are designing public spaces because of, of where they've gotten um, in terms of education and, and they're the architects or the landscape architects. Um, and so women historically have, have kind of been left out of this process, both in the design and then in the engagement of, of influencing what they look like. Um, and there is a, a, a town, um, a, a European town in Vienna that actually um, totally changed it up and said, and this was in the 90s, they said, we are going to design public spaces for women because they are the ones here who are, you know, for the most part, using them and taking care of the children of elderly parents. Um, they understand accessibility concerns. And so they created basically this, this town of, of public spaces for women. And it's been incredibly successful in the way that they've, they've changed their policy and their design, um, it has been incredible to see. And you, you start to see safer places. Um, you know, uh, there's a lot of concerns for women traveling at night, what, where like lighting is placed, how are you gonna get people out in public spaces to feel like there's more eyes on in, in that space and on the street. And so it's, you know, I think that the, the needle is shifting for sure. 
Um, but there needs to be more of a focus on um, really designing these spaces for the people who are using them, whether that's women or um, you know different socioeconomic demographics. And that's where I saw a question come through from Gabriella about how engagement and how that shapes this art and this placemaking. And I think it starts from even in the very temporary art um, of making sure that the community and all of the community is heard and what they wanna see um, in terms of public spaces and even down to just pop-up art that we're working on. Yeah, I think once you start um, understanding how much um, of the world around us is not designed for women, um, for anyone that's interested, there's a really great episode of the podcast, 99% Invisible. I don't know how many of you listen to that, but there's one about, um, how much of the world is not designed for women. One that was crazy was it wasn't until like the 2000s that they even made crash test dummies. It was like the late 90s or 2000s crash test dummies that mirrored a woman's body. So like these like inherently like safety based issues just were not in the way that they treat, um, you know, the way that medicine is tested, you know, the um, trials um, absent of women. Um, and so it's just, once you start to see it, you kind of can't stop, stop seeing it. So I'm, I'm really excited that you guys are working on those issues. For sure. Um, so I, we'll move into the questions. Um, I, you know, we're getting some some really great questions from our attendees. So we're going to move into some question asking. Um, so I actually there's a, there's one question that Gabriella asked about sign ordinances, and that actually Nolan and I in our jobs spend an inordinate amount of time <laughs> talking about signage. And so um, you know, Gabriella, your your local sign ordinance. Um, and I, I don't know if this, I, I assume you're asking this vis-a-vis -vis public art, but many sign ordinances were developed a long time ago and they were developed before people were really thinking about the inclusion of public art. So when you find sign ordinances that were done recently, they will create provisions for murals and they will put sort of some regulations around them, um, some more flexible, some less flexible. There isn't always a lot of continuity, but Gabrielle, if you're looking for your municipality to be more favorable towards public art, First, take a look at your sign ordinance and see if there's there are any provisions for public art. Uh, second, um, if there isn't, talk to your talk to your local, whether it's your local planning department, your local city council. You know, your city council can tell your planning department to look into why there are no provisions for murals. So it's if it's something that's not in your sign ordinance, you can do some advocating to get it included. And sometimes it doesn't need to be a text amendment to the sign ordinance. They can create a special ordinance that. Um, sort of put some parameters around public art or murals and allows them to exist. Because sometimes if, if it doesn't exist within the code, the interpretation will be that it's not allowed. So um, this is something that we include in our sign ordinances. So um, I, that's one question I was able to actually <laughs> answer, hopefully for you, Gabriella. Um, so Gabriella also had a question about public engagement, um, the role that public engagement has played in shaping art or placemaking activities early in the process. So um, we will start with Amanda on this one um, and then Rachel and Marisa. Yeah, so, so much um, public engagement is at the heart of what we do. Um, so much so that, you know, when we shifted to doing this in the pandemic, especially in places like California, I spend I'm not kidding you, probably 60 hours a week on Zoom, just talking to people and listening to what it is that they want. Um, so in some ways, I think that, um, you know, COVID has really provided an opportunity for more people to participate, but I think we're reaching kind of the end of that where people are wanting to talk to other people and we're all just kind of like shutting down and turning to the television and other things. Um, <clears throat> so outside of the issue that I think that we're kind of experiencing and seeing today, uh, public engagement is, is a huge part of what we do. So we do the stakeholder interviews at the beginning, uh, and then we do, um, you know, specific public engagement events that are a little bit more broad and targeted to the general public. Um, in those meetings, we are very, very focused on providing opportunities for the general public to participate. So, you know, wide open meetings, but also very targeted meetings, because we know that people are not going to just come out to a meeting to talk about art because they feel like they may not be welcome. Art isn't for them. It's for elitist people. But also there are those overlooked populations that are never involved uh, in, in conversations about planning. Um, so like in Fort Wayne, for instance, you know, we worked with 
um, an organization who trains Paralympics there in Fort Wayne. We, we asked them to host a focus group for us. We also paid two different artists to host focus groups that they invited their uh, peers to a meeting um, where they actually facilitated the conversation and we just sat in the back and took notes. Um, in Akron, we uh, have hosted a series of events, you know, with uh, age-friendly Akron, United Disability Services. We hosted once, once we hosted an artist focus group, we realized that there weren't enough artists of color in that meeting. They hadn't been, um, you know, sought after enough to, to feel like they wanted to come to that meeting. So we organized two separate meetings with black artists in particular. Um, and, and again, I just took notes um, on the side. Uh, but we kind of aggregate all that information together, which which really brings us to the recommendations that we put forward. And then um, once those recommendations have been hammered out, we then present them again to the public. We present them again to the general public and also back to those specific groups because um, we find that even when those groups participate and they're asked to participate, there's still a dismissive uh, nature. And they're like, you're not going to include what I said. So why are we here? I'm here for the snack or I'm here because I was asked to be here by the person who's facilitating and I want to support them. And so um, we're consistently coming back to those people and saying, hey, uh, did we hear you correctly? And if we didn't, can you please help us improve this recommendation? Because we're leaving and this plan is yours. Um, and, and, you know, we're finding some really great success uh, in doing that. Um, a couple of years ago, we began to actually pay uh, community facilitators, specifically artists. We, we began to pay them our hourly rate, um, you know, what we are charging the client. And when we did that, our participation began to like super soar, right? Because people are like, oh, you want to pay me to ask my friends to come and you're going to, you know, pay for us to all have dinner and you're going to actually listen to us. So we, we really do get meaningful um, feedback and really meaningful conversations. Uh, in, and I would say we're not a public engagement firm, but we really um, seek to make public engagement at the soul and the, the heart of what we do, because without those voices and without those ideas and representation, the plan is nothing and is irrelevant and should not be used. Yeah, I think the only thing that, you know, to, to add on to that um, is, you know, we are an engagement firm, we love doing engagement. And one of the ways that we see placemaking fitting into it is as a form of engagement. And so if we're creating something that's a temporary installation in a public space, why not use that as an opportunity to say like, hey, what do you hope that your community does in the future? What do you want to see for the future of this place? And so, you know, using place making activations as a way to, you know, grab people's attention. And, um, you know, we have done examples of like wishing trees of like, okay, let's fill this tree with all these beautiful colored tags and then like ask people to share their thoughts on them. So um, we're continuing to come up with ways to kind of incorporate engagement and place making as part of the same thing um, because, you know, they go together really well. Great. Um, well, thank you for that. And we are getting um, up to, you know, a quarter past the hour. So this is great. There are um, some really great questions here. We're going to um, try to document them. And um, this recording will be available on CNU Midwest's YouTube page. So we usually get up a short while after the episode. We will get that up. So if anyone would like to share the presentation, please feel free to do so. We would like to thank, give such a huge thanks to our amazing guests today, three amazing women doing amazing work. Um, we wish you all the best for your companies and the great work that you're doing. Um, so thanks again, Marisa, Amanda, and Rachel. I would also like to thank Nolan for being our guest host today. Nolan, great job. And um, see, uh, Midwest Changemakers, we put out about one episode per month. Uh, so stay tuned for our next episode. And thank you everyone for your participation today to all of our panelists and all of our attendees. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Thank you.